All right, now this is kind of a lengthy chapter in Leviticus, Leviticus 23, where there's a lot of, of just, and this is how a lot of the, you know, the books of Exodus and Leviticus can be, where there's a lot of detail given about the different offerings and sacrifices in the way that God wants them, had wanted the children of Israel to prepare everything. And, and this is the day that you do this and it's going to be held. To, you know, and these were all the feasts that he was telling them and explaining that they needed to hold. And you know, it's going to be seven days. And on the eighth day, you know, there's these extra Sabbaths. The Sabbaths were a day where you did no work in a day where you needed to rest, and they were holy. How many times do we read their holy convocations? It's a holy day God has set apart, and there's, all, there's a lot of different things. I'm not going to get into all of the details. You know, especially these chapters that seem to be boring. When you're doing your Bible reading, you're going through it, you kind of, your eyes can tend to gloss over. Pay attention to these, and you may not get it on your first few times through the Bible, but as you read more and more and more, there is a lot of symbolism Lots and lots and lots of symbolism in all of these various feasts. They're all teaching. It's, it's not in here. You know, nothing in the Bible is in there for no reason. It's not just because, you know, God doesn't have them holding these feasts and holding these, offering these sacrifices for, for, for nothing. We know from the New Testament, the Bible says it's not possible for the blood of bulls and of goats to, to cleanse us from sin. The purpose of that, all of that, was to show us, you know, as a paint a picture of Jesus Christ coming to be the Lamb that was sacrificed once for the, for the salvation of the whole world to wash away all of our sins. But that's that sacrifice. There's many other things that we can learn from these sacrifices. And on this passage, I want to hone in at the very, very end of the chapter when he said, when they kept the feast, this last feast that he was referring to, in the seventh month, he says in verse 40, we'll, start, we'll reread this real quick. In verse 40, And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, and the boughs of thick trees, and willows of the brook. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. And ye shall keep it a feast unto the Lord seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. Ye shall celebrate it in the seventh month. Look at verse 42. Ye shall dwell in booths seven days. All that are Israelites born shall dwell in booths. And he tells them the reason why. In this instance, he's saying, okay, for, these, for this particular feast, for this one feast I'm going to have you do, I need you, I want you to, to dwell in booths. Booths would be like tents, right? They're, 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 they're making up a, a small structure for themselves to stay in during the time of this particular feast for these seven days. He's like, you need to dwell in booths. And then he explains why in verse 43. He says that your generations... So it's not just them particularly, but for generations to come, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And Moses declared on the children of Israel the feast of the Lord. He's making a very specific point here. And he's saying, I want you, when you keep this feast, I want your generations to come to know what happened. There, there's many ways that they need to understand what happened. Because the, the bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt was a monumentous event. That is a huge event in the, in the Bible that, you know, when God brought them out with an with a, with a outstretched arm, you know, with a strong hand, He brought them out of Egypt. All the miracles that were performed, everything that happened through the wilderness, they had to wander in the wilderness of sin for 40, day, for 40 years. He made them dwell in booths. He, and, and essentially what they had to do, literally, and there's, there's so much symbolism in this, it's, it's hard to cover it all, but when they were going through the, the, the wilderness, they didn't know exactly where they were going. They had to rely on God every single day. And he didn't want them getting planted down. They were saying some days, you know, they had a, a, a pillar of cloud by the day. It was, it was a great cloud by day and a, and a pillar of fire by night. And when God was going to lead him, he would start moving and they'd have to pick up and they'd all have to go and follow where the Lord wanted them to go. And then when he, when he rested on the tabernacle, then they would all stay. They'd pitch, up, they'd pitch their tents and they'd stick around and they'd be there for as long as God wanted them there. And they were learning to completely rely on where God wanted them to be. They had to completely trust in Him. And there's, you know, we read all throughout the book of Exodus, all the many lapses that they had in faith and being able to trust God. There's a particular instance when, 
you know, they were complaining because there's no water and they're like, you know, why did God lead us out of Egypt to just to die in this desert? You know, there's no water here. We're all going to die. And they want to go back to Egypt, you know, over and over and over again. And they're being taught by God, no, I know what you need. And in one particular instance, they were literally just, just really, really close to this great oasis where there's palm trees and wells of water and everything else, but they decided to be murmuring and complaining right before they approached their destination. If they would have just had the faith to continue following God, they would have made it to that destination without, you know, and, and made it through everything that they were dealing with. But um, they were being taught to rely on God and rely on Him completely. Now, this particular feast, he says, okay, when you keep this feast, you, you need to carry this out. You need to be dwelling in booths for this feast because your children need to be taught this. And there's so much teaching that goes on through traditions. And what I'm going to be preaching about this morning is traditions that have meaning. Now, oftentimes when people talk about religion or the Bible, and traditions, it's a negative connotation. People are always saying, oh, you know, because they're referring to the traditions of men. Because oftentimes what gets preached the most or what people think about the most is that when Jesus Christ was rebuking the Pharisees, saying, you're teaching for doctrine the tradition of men. I'm not going to go into the tradition of men today, but we're going to go into some of God's traditions to see what he would have us to learn. Because traditions are important and they could be very important when you have the right ones. It's good to keep good traditions because they have teachings and symbolism that get carried on from generation to generation to generation. So that, you know, and God designed it this way so that even when people will, will stray from the Lord, there's, there's always, there should always be this remnant of things that are just done by tradition, even when people don't quite understand why in the moment. Anyone that wants to figure it out or research, well, why do we even do things this way? They can figure out why they're doing it and it will stem back to the Lord commanding this be done. Because you think about it, even when people, if people back then, when they start doing a tradition, say, we're going to do this every year. Every year we have the same feast. We have the feast. We have the feast. We have the feast. And it just becomes a habit. It becomes a tradition. It becomes something that they do. A lot of the people probably won't understand all the meaning behind it. Because they don't know the scripture, they don't know the Bible, and they just do it, and, and traditions get handed down from generation to generation. Oftentimes the meaning gets lost, but the meaning can become revived again later on. Now this particular one that we read about is real interesting. Turn, if your, Bibles, turn your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. We're going to start reading in verse number 8. So again, the, the reason why he had him dwell in those booths, part of the reason, I believe, is to keep him humble. They were supposed to dwell in those tents and, and to give him that reminder of, hey, you know, you got brought out and saved from great, terrible bondage from the Egyptians. And God led you through this wilderness. And when, when he's going to, he knows he's bringing them into the promised land and they're going to be in a land flowing with milk and honey, a great land, a, a great blessings are going to come and they're going to become, you know, planted, rooted down. They're going to build their houses. They're going to build their, their places. And God knows the, the nature of man when we have a tendency, when we get too comfortable to kind of forget about God. And just, just don't not be very thankful for all the blessings that we have. Oftentimes, man's heart can be, can be very wicked. And, and when you start to accumulate and have a lot of blessings in your life, you start to come to expect those blessings. And then you start to, to you know, many times people will have a, a greedy type of a heart or a covetous heart where now all of a sudden all these things you have isn't enough and you're looking for more and more and more. God doesn't want that to happen. So in this particular feast, he wants them to remember and to humble themselves and say, there was a time when we were brought through and this is what we had to live in all the time. When they actually get their houses, when they get settled down, when they have all these blessings, he wants them to be able to look back and remember and say, yeah, it wasn't always this great. And God made a great deliverance when he brought us out and he actually had us living in booths for a while but praise the Lord now we have these nice houses and stuff and this should be something that every year they could kind of have 
this, this reset in their mind to, to bring them down to earth, to keep them humble and keep them in remembrance of the things that they went through. Nehemiah 8, let's start reading in verse number 8 because we're going to see something real interesting about this feast. The Bible reads, So they read in the book of in the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is the Tirshatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites taught, that taught the people, said unto all the people, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace, for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and to drink and to send portions and to make great mirth, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. And on the second day were gathered together the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests and the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law, which the Lord had commanded by Moses, that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month, and that they should publish and proclaim in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth unto the mount and fetch olive branches and pine branches and myrtle branches and palm branches and branches of thick trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths, every one upon the roof of his house and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the street of the water gate and in the street of the gate of Ephraim. Look at verse 17. And all the congregation of them that were come again out of the captivity made booths and sat under the booths for since the days of Jeshua the son of Nun unto that day had not the children of Israel done so. And there was very great gladness. Now, it took them to being taken captive again before they finally saw the importance of following this aspect of the feast. So what we see here, just, just in case you're not aware, to bring up the speed of where we're at in the Bible, we were reading in Deuteronomy. This is, those were when Moses was giving the law of the Lord, right? Moses led them all the way up to the promised land, but he was not allowed to bring them in. Joshua, the son of Nun, he was the one that kind of carried on the torch. He was the next leader after Moses. He's the one that actually brought them into the promised land. He helped them fight their battles and to defeat all the, you know, the enemies that were in there and take over that land. That was right after Moses had delivered the message, you know, God's law, under the children of Israel. Joshua is the next in line. And it says here that since the days of Joshua, they did not keep this aspect of the law. So essentially, as soon as they got planted in their place, in the promise, as soon as they settled down, this dwelling in booth thing never happened. Now, this is a long, long period of time that happened from the, between the times of Joshua to the times of where we're reading in Nehemiah. Nehemiah, this is when the children of Israel are, being, are going back into Israel from being taken captive by the Babylonians. Okay, now to give you an idea of the amount of time that has gone by, you have from Joshua, the son of Nun, and I'll read this from Acts 13, it says, And after that he gave unto them judges, about the space of 450 years until Samuel the prophet. So th when, they started, when, they, when they started in the promised land, they were governed by judges. They had people who would judge God's law. They were living. God was their king. He was supposed to be their king. And they were supposed to just be obeying God's law. And that was the government that they had a theocracy and they had judges that would help to you know, make discernment on issues where you know, there's disputes between people or whatever, they would have judges. And the judges are the ones who were, who were essentially, you know, ruling and, and keeping the government of, the, of Israel going. And that was for 450 years they had judges. After that came Samuel the prophet. He's basically the last judge. 
and after Samuel started the reign of all the kings of Israel and Judah. So, <coughs> we have the judges ruling for, at least, for about 450 years. In Matthew 1.17, it says, So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon and to Christ are 14 generations. Now, I'm using these verses just to give you, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to... Give the exact number of years. You'd have, you'd have to go through a lot more detail to, to pin down the number of years. I'm giving you an estimate here. So we have 450 years of the time of the judges. Then you have Samuel. Then you have Saul. And then we're looking at David. And it says here from David until, the car until they were carried away captive into Babylon is 14 generations. Now... We're going to use a number of, let's say, 30 years for generation. It's a rough estimate because a generation is about how long you go between like parent, child, parent, child. It's not how long a person lives. So when, you, when you're looking at generations, it's just, you know, people average probably about 30 years old. You have a child 30 years old. And that, that's a, a, a fair estimate. And for what we're doing, you know, it's not that scientific. We don't have to pinpoint the next years. I just want to give you an idea of how long this was going on for. So 14 generations times 30 years is 420 years. So you've got 450 years during the time of Judges plus another 420 years. And not counting you know, the actual time of Saul's reign and Samuel and everything else. We're talking about, and then they, by the time they came back into the, the Promised Land was another 70 years that they were taken captive for in Babylon. That's over 900 years. Over 900, I mean think about 900 years ago was what, the year 1115? You know, I mean, like 900 years back from today? That's a long time for having God's Word around and the people not following what God had prescribed for them to do. And, and there's, there's no question about it. It's written there. It's not like, well, that's your interpretation. No, I mean, he said you keep the feast and you make booths under yourself. We read the whole chapter in Deuteronomy. We all, we all went through it and it said it very clearly and plainly. It wasn't until Nehemiah gets up and you know, they're, they're reading the law. They're getting back to God. They're getting back right with God. They're turning back to the Lord and they're reading in the law of the Lord. And that's why it also said, you know, they were sad. A lot of people were sad. They were crying because they hear the law of the Lord. And they start to realize, man, we've been doing a lot of things wrong. They get pricked in their heart. And this ignorance of God's word is horrible. And that's why, that's one of the reasons why a lot of stuff falls by the wayside. People don't know the scripture. They don't know that what they're doing is wrong. They don't know they're not following the Lord the way they're supposed to do. Uh, way too often people trust in the way things have always been done. They trust in the fact, well, they, you know, we've always done things this way, so it must be the right way, so we're going to keep on doing things that way. But you see how easy it is for something to just fall by the wayside. And if we're not diligently, and diligently looking into God's Word and diligently focusing and studying, how easy we can just say, well, I mean, the feast has always been kept this way. Why should we dwell? No one's ever dwelt in booths. And it can even make you question, be like, well, this says dwell in booths, but you know, no, one, no one's ever done that. You know, the pastor never said anything about that. The priest, you know, the high priest never said anything about that. Why should we dwell in booths? You know, I don't know what, I don't know what this is talking about. I don't understand that. When it's real simple, God wanted them to dwell in booths. Over 900 years, the feast was not celebrated properly. Now, of course, we live in a fallen world today, and unfortunately, elements of God's Word seem to fall by the wayside, especially within our culture. I mean, you think about, think about the time of the kings, just that, that time period when the kings of Israel and Judah were reigning. You read about when the righteous kings would come and try to get the, to get the, the nation back in line with God. There were, there were these righteous God, kings that God had respect for, and he would, you know, They'd be praised in the Bible, but there were still oftentimes things that they didn't, they didn't get right. How many times did it say, you know, but they didn't remove the high places? You know, God didn't want the children of Israel worshiping in the high places. He, he gave them the tabernacle, and then after that was the temple. And he said, 
This is where I'm going to be worshipped. This is where I want to be served. The high places were used to worship false gods and to worship false idols. And what happened is, you know, people would come in and they would just, just kind of modify it. to Well, we're going to worship the Lord here. You know, it's like you're taking all of your, the ways that you, you celebrate or worship a false god and you're going to Christianize it. You're going to make it more like the Lord and say, oh, well, people are kind of used to this, so we're going to let them keep on going to these high places. But instead of worshiping Baal, we're just going to worship the Lord there. And that's how these things get started. And then people just continue doing it that way and keep doing it that way and keep doing it that way until people don't even think about it anymore. But we need to constantly be questioning what we do, why we do it, and comparing it to Scripture. Because if this can happen for over 900 years, it makes you think, well, what are we doing today that's just being done strictly by tradition and is not being done according to the word of the Lord? We need to be able, we need to have a ready mind that's able to analyze in everything and don't just assume and say, hey, well, this is what Baptists are doing all over the country. Everybody's doing it this way. What, a good example that comes to my mind right now, I think of is like the Lord's Supper, right? I mean, Baptists will, will, will participate in uh, uh, what's called the Lord's Supper, right? Where you take the, the body which is broken for you and, the, and you drink the wine, that's, that was the blood that was shed from Jesus Christ. And in most churches today, what they'll do is they'll, they'll hand out these little wafers, right? The unleavened bread, but it's like pre-packaged pre and pre-cut or whatever into this perfect little mold. And what's being lost is the, you know, Jesus Christ, when he took the bread, he break it. And he gave. And that's symbolizing his body, which is broken for you. And that's, and that's one small thing. But look, everything that God has established in here carries a meaning. And when we start to change the way that God has, has laid out for us to do something, then we lose a lot of that meaning. And you know, for that example, you, know, you get these little preformed pre little squares or whatever you have when you do that, and you can say, oh, what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that Jesus Christ took the bread and he broke it, and then he gave it to his disciples. And if you're here for, for a time when we, when we, when we participate, participate in communion, we have the, 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 the unleavened bread that's broken. It's not in these perfect little pieces. And, and you could say, oh, you're just nitpicky. No, I'm not nitpicky. I'm just trying to do things as, the best as possible according to God's word. And these things change over time and it just becomes convenient. You become used to, well, you know, and, and, and I have to look at this stuff especially hard myself because, you know, I have a tendency to rely, well, this is how I was taught, so I'm going to keep on doing things the way that I was taught as well. Now, that's not necessarily wrong unless it contradicts what the Bible says. I need to be able to look at this book and say, well, we've, I've always been doing things this way because that's how I was brought up. That's how I was raised. That's how I was taught. This is how I was trained. But if it con conflicts with what the scripture says, if, if God's way is even a little bit different, then I ought to change and do things the way that this book says. And we ought to have the, the courage to be able to make that change, even if that means people are going to be looking at you different or saying, you know, what are you doing? It doesn't matter because we need to be obeying and looking at what this book says. Another example from the Bible um, where people, where they, they didn't do things God's way, it actually had severe consequences. You remember when the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, when, when the children of Israel were defeated by the Philistines, when, uh, when King Saul was, was battling the Philistines, and the Philistines came and they took the Ark of the Covenant away, then when they conquered them, they took it away. And then David became king and he started defeating them and they, they were being plagued by this Ark of the Covenant. They, they were having it there and it was causing all kinds of plagues on their people. They're like, we got to get rid of this thing, right? So they, they put it on a cart and they, and they have these oxen, you know, taking it away and they have, you know, all their, um, their astrologers or whatever are saying, their, their wise men, so-called, were saying, okay, send it off and if it goes the way towards Bashan, they're like, then we know that, that this is what it's supposed to be doing. And they did. And they, and they went the way it was supposed to go. And, um, but it was on a cart. Now, previous to that, when God laid out the way that they were supposed to transport the Ark of the Covenant, he had the rods out that was always supposed to be carried manually by hand. When the children of Israel finally realized, hey, here's the Ark of the Covenant, it's back. 
they don't, they don't follow the way that God laid out the way they're supposed to transport it. So they kept it on this cart. Like, hey, this is pretty neat. It's on a cart. What a good idea. This makes it a lot easier. We'll just have the animals take it and carry it. You know, it's kind of heavy. Why should we burden ourselves and carry it that way? We'll let the cart do it. And, of course, what happens, the, you know, the ox stumbles, and then the cart wobbles, and Uzzah puts forth his hand to keep it from falling on the ground. He's thinking, whoa, this is, you know, this is holy. This is the Ark of the Covenant. We don't want this falling on the ground. He sticks out his hand to reach it and to save it from falling. And what does God do? God strikes him dead. Uzzah shouldn't have been putting his hands on the Ark of the Covenant. And they shouldn't have been carrying it in a cart. People would say, you know, well, why would God kill him for that? I mean, he was just trying to do what was right. He didn't do it the way that God said to do it. We need to make sure that we're, that, we're, that we're being adhering to the words of the Lord and not just, just taking things into our own hands and just saying, well, I want to do it this way. Just like Cain and Abel. You know, they both brought forth sac their, their own offerings unto the Lord. But God had respect unto Abel's offering. He didn't have respect unto Cain's offering. Why? Because Cain didn't give the offering that God had wanted, what God had said he wanted. Abel brought the blood sacrifice. He brought the, the animal sacrifice, whereas Cain brought the best of the fruit of his hands, his own good works, his own labor that he brought forth as the sacrifice. And again, a lot of symbolism in that story as well. But the bottom line is, you know, and God just didn't accept it. He said, I don't accept that, that offering because that's not what I said I wanted. That is not what I called for. But, you know, Cain said, well, this is what I do, and this is the best that I have. I'm giving my best unto you. But if you're not doing it the, way, the right way, God's not going to have respect for it, even if it is your best. And it, I believe, I firmly believe that was Cain's best. He was giving God the best of his works, the best of his fruit. But God looked at it, and he had no respect unto it. And he's like, look, Cain, you know, because Cain got all angry. Then he got upset. He's saying, you know, well, fine then. I don't understand. You know, you're taking Abel's offering, you're not taking mine. And God's like, look, you know, if you do well, you'll be accepted. It's that simple. If you just, just follow what I say, just do what I told you to do. I have no preference of Abel over you as a person. You, I just want you to do what I told you to do. And it's that simple. You, you can't just take, you know, what God has said and just change it the way, yeah, he wants me to do this, but I could do this a lot better, so I'm just going to give him this. Same thing with offering the strange fire before the Lord. The sons of Aaron. Right? God already he laid it out and said, this is the way I want it made. When you, when you make the incense, when you put it together, it needs to be made this way, made from this, these special ingredients. This is what it needs to be. Don't offer anything else. That's the way I want it. And they think, hey, we're going to offer something different. We're going to bring them this. God killed them. And these are, these are serious, you know, you know, Uzzah died, the sons of Aaron, the two sons of Aaron died. These are serious punishments that, that, you know, repercussions, I should say, that came in their lives because they were not strictly adhering to the word of the Lord. They did not follow it. And um, we need to make sure that we're continually comparing what we do and what we believe and the way that we practice our religion and everything that we do in accordance to the Bible. We need to make sure that we don't get too comfortable with the routines of today and assume that we're just doing everything right because that's the way we've always done it or that's the way we've seen other people always doing it. We need to constantly be examining ourselves and what the Bible prescribes for us to do. Don't assume that traditions are correct. However, traditions do hold a good place and have good value in our lives when we're doing them the right way. We want to be able to set that pattern forth the right way. If they would have kept that from the, from the times of Joshua right when they received it, they probably would have continued to keep doing things the same way because we tend to be creatures of habit. But we need to make sure that we're still... Even though we're habitual, looking back and just comparing, saying, are we doing this right? Okay, yeah, I think we're doing this right. <clears throat> and of course, the reason for these traditions in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, is because they're, they're truths and they carry symbolism of, of, of other great truths. Now, I think about the tradition, a traditional marriage. For example, I've thought about this a lot lately because I didn't even know myself a lot of the reasons why we do the things that we do. You know, why does the bride wear white? Why does the bride wear a veil? Why does, you know, why, 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 why? Why are all these, why does the father, you know, give away his daughter? 
why do these things all, why do we do this stuff? And it, it's very formal, right? Very traditional. Well, this is the way things have been done. And the reason for, the, for that tradition, there, there is, there's meaning behind all of it. There's meaning behind the reason why the wife wears what she wears. There's meaning behind the colors. There's meaning behind the, the father giving the daughter away. Turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 30. There's a great truth here that has completely fallen by the wayside. And honestly, just reading this passage will probably make people angry in Numbers chapter 30. I mean, in the culture that we live in today, this just reading this out loud will probably make some people angry. And, you know, that's not, hopefully, you know, uh, hopefully no Christian is going to get angry at, at reading God's word. But this flies in the face of, of our culture today in regards to women and daughters and wives. We have a backward society. But don't let that pollute your mind in the way that we ought to be doing things. And you know, and this, this ties in with a father giving a daughter away. Let's read this whole chapter, starting in verse number 1, Numbers 30. Look at verse number 1. And Moses spake unto the heads of the tribes concerning the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord hath commanded. So if right off the bat, he's saying, look, this is what God commanded. This isn't my words. God commanded this. Verse 2. If a man vow a vow unto the Lord or swear an oath to bind his soul with a bond, he shall not break his word. He shall do according to all that proceedeth out of his mouth. If a, that makes perfect sense, right? He's saying, look, men, if you make a vow, you need to keep that vow. God's going to hold you to it. You need to be a man of your word. Let's keep reading. Verse number three. If a woman also vow a vow unto the Lord, and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house in her youth, and her father hear her vow, and her bond wherewith she hath bound her soul, and her father shall hold his peace at her, then all her vows shall stand, and every bond wherewith she hath bound her soul shall stand. But if her father disallow her in the day that he heareth, not any of her vows or of her bonds, wherewith she hath bound her soul, shall stand. And the Lord shall forgive her, because her father disallowed her. So this is saying, you know, if there's a father, he hears his daughter that's living in his house, under his authority. If she, and people, you know, don't get this. They'll say, well, wait a minute. You know, we're all individual persons, and that's your relationship with God. So what do you mean? If she vows a vow, then the father can just say, nope. That's what the Bible says. The father has that authority. Now, nobody, no other family member can tell the father if he decides to make a vow and a vow, God says, you better keep that. No one else is going to disallow that. But if the daughter decides to, to make a vow unto God, and, to, and keep a marriage in mind here too, because marriage is a vow. It's a vow before God. Any of my daughters are living in my household, they want to make a vow unto God, and I hear it, and I don't like that vow, and I don't want them to take it, I'm going to say, no, I have the authority to completely disannul that vow. Let's keep reading. And God won't hold her responsible for that either, because if you break your vows unto God, God does hold you responsible for that. And it also says here, you know, if, if the father decides, okay, I'm going to let that, I'm not going to say anything about that, I've heard that, that, that vow is going to be, and then that will be good. And she will be holding to that vow. But the father has the choice of basically vetoing that vow. Let's keep reading here. Verse number six. And if she had at all an husband, when she vowed or uttered aught out of her lips, wherewith she bound her soul, and her husband heard it, and held his peace at her in the day that he heard it, then her vows shall stand, and her bonds wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. But if her husband disallowed her, on the day that he heard it, then he shall make her vow which she vowed, and that which she uttered with her lips, wherewith she bound her soul, of none effect, and the Lord shall forgive her. So again, we're seeing the same thing. Now it's not a daughter, it's a wife. If the husband hears a vow that the, that the wife is making, he has that same veto power that he had over his daughters. 
This is God's established authority structure and, and the way that he made it. He says, look, the head of the household is, is the father. It's the husband. He's in charge of these things and he can disallow your personal vows to God. If he doesn't agree with it, he doesn't think you should be doing those things. Let's keep reading. Verse number nine. But every vow of a widow or and of her that is divorced wherewith they have bound their souls shall stand against her. And if she vowed in her husband's house or bound her soul by a bond with an oath, and her husband heard it and held his peace at her and disallowed her not, then all her vows shall stand and every bond wherewith she bound her soul shall stand. But if her husband shall utterly, or excuse me, but if her husband hath utterly made them void on the day he heard them, then whatsoever proceeded out of her lips concerning her vows or concerning the bond of her soul shall not stand. Her husband hath made them void and the Lord shall forgive her. Every vow and every binding oath to afflict the soul, her husband may establish it or her husband may make it void. But if her husband altogether hold his peace at her from day to day, then he establisheth all her vows or all her bonds which are upon her. He confirmeth them because he held his peace at her in the day that he heard them. And again, you know, on, on a completely side note, this is proving to us as well that when you keep silent, silence is agreement. When you don't say anything, when people are, are, are spewing out all kinds of nonsense and, and maybe hatred against God or against the Bible and stuff, and, you do, and you're in a group and like you're witnessing this stuff and you just don't say anything, people are going to think that you're agreeing with that because you're not saying anything to the contrary. Keep that in mind. But that is not what I'm talking about this evening because the husband it's saying here or the father has the authority to disannul any vows that, that, that their wife or their daughter makes unto God. Verse 15, we're almost done here. But if he shall anyways, but if he shall anyways make them void after that he hath heard them, then he shall bear her iniquity. These are the statutes which the Lord commanded Moses between a man and his wife, between the father and his daughter, being yet in her youth, in her father's house. This is talking about vows. And as I mentioned earlier, a marriage vow is a vow before God. And in my household, I'll just let you know the way I'm doing it because I believe the Bible, I believe God's word, and I believe I have the authority. And you could call me old-fashioned and a fuddy-duddy or whatever you want to call me, but people used to go, when they wanted to marry a girl, they would used to go and ask the father's permission. They would say, even just to take a, take a girl out on a date or to spend time with her or anything like that, they would go and ask the father's permission. And I'll tell you this right now, my girls, as long as they live in my household and they're under my authority, they will need to have permission to, to marry the man that wants to marry them. Now, I'm not going to pick and choose their husband for them. I'll let them do that. But if there's some creep or some lowlife or some guy that's not going to be able to provide for them, because what I'm doing when they get married is they are going from being under my protection, being under my, you know, my caring for them, my paying for them, my doing everything for them, into going for the husband being in charge and taking care of them and being responsible for them and making sure that they are, they are well taken care of and provided for. I am going to make sure that the man that they married is going to be capable of doing those things. A man that loves God and a man that will be able to take care of my daughters. God has allowed me to be in that position to where I can disannul those vows. That's why it's so important to get that. And that's why it's so important. You know, there's a, there, you know men... <laughs> <coughs> men know what other men can be like in a way that women don't always know and don't always understand and can be naive about. And if we were to follow all of God's rules, things could be so much better off for everybody. And you know what? There may be times where, where a, a girl, a young, a young woman might be upset because her, her dad doesn't approve of a guy, but you may not realize this when you're at that age, but dads have been around a lot longer than you. And they've known a lot of guys and they've seen a lot of things and they've seen a lot the way that people can be. And there should be a very good reason why he's not going to want you to marry a, a certain type of guy. Even if in your heart you feel so much emotion for a person. 
there's a good reason for that. And, you know, and if this was being, being practiced today and if people cared enough about their children and cared enough about the, the, the people that they're letting, their, especially their daughters, spend time with, who they're spending their time with, you know, marriages, I believe, can last a lot longer. And um, again, this isn't saying that I'm just going to just dictate it like, you must marry this person. No, because I don't have that authority. I'm not, I'm not arranging that marriage. All I'm doing is saying, you know, hopefully, and hopefully they'll just learn on their own well enough anyways through the teaching and the Bible to look for that godly man, to look for someone who loves the Lord, to look for someone who is a worker, a hard worker, and it's not just going to be lazy and slothful but they'll be able to find somebody that I won't even have to exercise this type of authority and just say no. That they already know what things to look for and are doing a good job of discerning that. But God has given that authority unto men. Now look, this has not been repealed in the New Testament anywhere. This is scripture that stands, that stands to this day. Now, just because it's not necessarily Follow, just because you can talk to plenty of other Christian families that might even look at you like you're nuts if you were to say that you do these types of things, doesn't mean that just because that's the way it's been done, well, that's just the way it is, or that's right. Or, well, yeah, that's just, people did that a long time ago, but I don't know why they did that. Here's why they did it. Because they were following biblical principles. There's a good reason for it, but a lot of people have forgotten those good reasons. The same thing with the, with the color of the dress. They had white... You know why they wear white? It's because a, a, a woman getting married is supposed to be pure. She's supposed to be virgin, and that white is representing that pureness. Because that's the way it's supposed to be. People shouldn't be going out and fornicating and sowing their wild oats and having all this quote-unquote fun before they finally settle down with a spouse. That's wickedness. The white in the wedding dress is purity. That is something to be exalted. These days, it's looked down upon. Oh, what? You haven't been with a guy? You haven't been with a girl? That's what the kids these days are talking about. And the cool kids are the ones that are just having all kinds of fornication. It's wickedness. Don't let this world deceive you. Don't get caught up in the, the world's wisdom and the world's wickedness. <clears throat> Not all traditions are bad. We need to understand why we do certain things the way that we do them. We need to make sure we're, we're reading God's laws. We're reading God's words. We're reading the entire Bible and putting into practice even some of these, one, you know, I mean, numbers. You don't, you don't, you know, people aren't, you, how often do you hear someone say, man, my favorite book of the Bible is the book of numbers, right? It just, it's not, I mean, you have Matthew, John, you know, Romans, Acts. My personal book is Acts. I love the book of Acts. But they're all important. It's all God's word. There's lots to be learned from. And if we want to just be completely pleasing unto God, we really ought to make sure that, and, and not just pleasing unto him, but doing things just the right way in a godly way. And, and you know, if God's given husbands or, or fathers this authority, hey, take that authority seriously. He's given that to you for a reason. Make sure that you have yourself in a position to be able to make those right, proper, good decisions. Take that. To make sure you are educated enough in the Bible and you know God's word well enough to be able to discern and make the right choices and make the right and be able to know when to disallow a vow. And when you do have to step in and just say no, no, you, that vow is not going to stand. Now, you know, in our culture, a lot of people, there's, there's really not many people making vows unto God in general. It doesn't happen very often. Sometimes people do. But think about this. How many people do you think have vowed a vow unto God? And, and this probably does happen quite a bit where maybe they're involved in some kind of a sin, a major sin, maybe something like, like they're a drunk and you're like, you know, God, I promise I'll never do this again. And then like a week later, they're doing it again. Right? And it could be anything. I mean, you pick alcohol, pick, pick whatever. And, you know, hopefully, if you're a husband or a father, if, if you know, like, because breaking a vow to God is very serious. Very serious offense. People today just kind of think about their word as like nothing. Like it's not a big deal if you're like, oh, well, pff, yeah, I broke that vow, whatever. Well, I'm just a sinner anyway, so who cares? Not a big deal. 
When you vow a vow unto God, God expects you to keep that. So as a husband or father, if you hear your daughter or your wife even maybe make a, almost a frivolous vow or a vow that you think that like, you know what? They're probably not going to be able to keep that. It's better off to, dis, to, to just, disavow, just disavow that, disannul that vow. Because by breaking it then, you know, it'll be worse off for them. So there's a lot of different things that to, to, you could think about and, and apply that um, this breaking of vows with. But the one that I focus on the most is the, is the vow of marriage. Because that's a vow that should last a lifetime. It's an important vow. And I believe a father should be very involved in the sense that he knows the type of person, you know, that wants to marry your daughter. And hopefully the daughters have no problems with, a, with their father approving of the man that they love and they want to marry. Because, you know, your father loves you more than you understand. If you're a daughter, your father loves you. You cannot understand the love that a father has for his daughter. I've got three. And I'll tell you that for a fact. And obviously parents love their, you know, fathers love their sons as well. But when, you know, our job as men, as a father is, is really, you know, men have a, boys and sons, you know, they're going to grow up to be their own fathers and be their own husbands and their own leaders and, and being able to take charge in things. And, you know, they need to be taught as well. To, to make the right decisions, but it's a different teaching because the woman and the daughters and the wives are given specific roles where they're not the ones out doing the breadwinning. They should be taken care of by either their father or their husband. So in order for a father to make sure that their daughter is going to continue to be cared for, they need to find the right husband. Someone that's going to respect them, love them, and treat them very well. <clears throat> Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words. We thank you for the great truths of the Bible. Lord, I know that, that things aren't always well received in, in today's culture and in today's society, but I believe your words, and, I, and, and you know what, God, I can see the wisdom behind your words. I pray that you please help us all to, to understand these great truths and to, and to be able to not be afraid to, to adhere to them and to use them and to, uh, to do things the, the way that you prescribed for us, dear Lord. And um, I pray that you please help us all to be, to be stirred up, to continue to, to get into our Bibles on a daily basis and to read and to read and to read and to study and to understand, dear God, that um, we can live the best lives, po lives possible and guide our children's lives and help them out um, to be the best children and uh, grow up to be the best adults that they can be as well, dear Lord, um, with as much influence from your word as possible. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.